Welcome to the PA Books podcast. PA Books is a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. This program features interviews with authors of books on Pennsylvania people, history, sports, business, nature, and politics. While the focus is always on Pennsylvania, topics like the Revolutionary War, the Battle of Gettysburg, the Industrial Revolution, the coal and steel industries, and authors like John Updike, David McCullough, and John Grogan have a universal appeal. We hope you enjoy this podcast. This week on PA Books, the author of The Complete Gettysburg Guide, J. David Petruzzi. David Petruzzi, author of The Complete Gettysburg Guide. Do you remember the first time you ever went to Gettysburg? Uh, yeah, when I was probably, it was, it was during a school trip, and um, I believe it was in the sixth grade. Um, like a, a lot of people, you know, and especially when, when you're that age, you're um, really attracted to the terrain features down there. The, the kids love to crawl over Devil's Den. And probably, you know, somebody is, is speaking about uh, what happened during the battle, you know, with these different, different units, and this happened there. And, and of course, that age, you're not listening. <laughs> you're enjoying the, the boulders of Devil's Den or uh, the monuments. Um, you know, they, they hold a lot of interest for kids. Uh, the cannons, the artillery, you know, very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, about, about that time, and I, I didn't take anything about the battle or the town, you know, very seriously then. Uh, that, that basically developed later. But um, I'm like a lot, of, yeah, a, lot of, a lot of people that have an interest in it now that basically came back to it as an adult, you know, had some connection with it. When, when they were a child. Did you get interested in history young, or was that something I that did, came yeah, I did. I, I have a lot of, lot of varied interests um, as far as history is concerned, not, uh, not just American history, but it, as I uh, mentioned in the, the introduction, um, a lot of ancient world history just captures you know, my, my attention. Um, I'm of Italian descent, so I love ancient, ancient uh, uh, Italian studies, uh, Greece and, and so forth, but American history really has been the primary um, interest that I've had as far as history. How many times do you think you've been to Gettysburg Battlefield? Oh boy, this year? <laughs> um, I think probably six or eight times already this year, and that's, that's been pretty typical for uh, about the past 10 years. So I, I, over my lifetime, uh, hundreds, and, and every experience you know, is, is, is brand new, uh, a brand new learning experience. But uh, yeah, quite a few. That's, that's kind of been my, my primary destination for, for my adult life. Do you tell us about other Civil War battlefields, or is it Gettysburg the one for you? Gettysburg has, has ba mainly been the one um, be because of its closeness, its proximity. Um, being a Pennsylvanian, uh, and I know it's federal land, it's federal ground, it's a federal park, but I think a lot of us Pennsylvanians um, have a feeling of sort of ownership you know, of Gettysburg because it's, it's ours, it's, it's in Pennsylvania. But um, it, being what a lot of people consider to be the most important battle or the turning point of the Civil War. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's captured my attention and I think so many people. Of course, whether it was really a turning point or the most important is, is debatable, you know, and, and a lot of people do get, get into that subject, but um, Gettysburg has always been, for me, my primary interest, but not so much for those reasons. Um, basically, because my initial interest in the Civil War really dealt with the cavalry. Um, and again, this goes back to, to my childhood. I was uh, always interested in the cowboys and Indians, you know, sort of thing. And uh, I love horses. I've never owned them, but ridden them quite a bit. And in fact, I've, I've been in reenactments as a, as a mounted cavalry reenactor. Um, that was actually my initial interest in the Civil War, which kind of grew out of an interest in the Indian Wars, uh, which followed in the, in the decades after the Civil War. But Gettysburg has a lot of cavalry aspects to it that initially captured my interest. Um, we, we think of Gettysburg as the three days in July, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, but really the campaign was over six weeks, starting in early June um, and actually ending about the 1st of August. And all through there, um, those, those six weeks, and even during the three days of the Gettysburg battle, the cavalry of both sides participated in many battles and skirmishes, uh, many of which shaped how the battle you know, would take place and, in fact, exactly where it would be because the Federal Cavalry actually opened the Battle of Gettysburg. Can you explain the there's there's two battlefields that you have in the East Cavalry Battlefield and the is it the South yes. Cavalry yeah. Battlefield? Can you explain how they fit in? There's actually um, to get really specific about it, I like to think of the cavalry battlefields on all points of the compass. And actually, there is 
um, the South Cavalry Battlefield, which many people are aware of, on July 3rd, the third day of the battle, uh, Federal Cavalry uh, conducted a mounted charge against Confederate infantry. This was right after Pickett's charge started to peter out. So that's South Cavalry Field. Um, a lot of folks called the, the Cavalry Battle that happened on, late on the afternoon of July 2nd, the second day of the battle, uh, at Hunterstown, which is about four miles northeast of Gettysburg, they call that North Cavalry Battlefield. So we have North and South. When you go to the east, about three or four miles east of, of the main battlefield, is what is known as East Cavalry Battlefield. And that's where the Confederate Cavalry Commander General Jeb Stewart um, battled Federal Cavalry, which, which was commanded by General David Gregg, with a little bit of help from a fellow named Custer, who kind of gets most of the, <laughs> the spotlight. But there's East Cavalry Field, and I've always dubbed um, the area west of Gettysburg West Cavalry Field because on June the 26th there was actually quite a bit of skirmishing between Confederate cavalry which was moving through the area uh, and by the way coming towards this this area um, Gettysburg and Camp Hill right the Susquehanna area um, so that was on June the 26th but also uh, as I just mentioned federal cavalry under General John Buford actually opened the Battle of Gettysburg on that exact same ground uh, west of Gettysburg on the morning of July 1st against Confederate infantry. So there's the four points of the compass that actually surrounding the battlefield you have north, south, east, and west cavalry battlefields. Can you explain how a cavalry battle would take place if it was one cavalry against another versus a mm -hmm. cavalry against an infantry? How would they fight? Um, it, it, it depended really on the, the tactics of the day and it was really starting to change during the Civil War. But during the Gettysburg Campaign, most of the cavalry battles that happened, and there, there were several, were actually what are called meeting engagements. Um, the, the Battle of Hunterstown, which we have a tour of in the book, um, as well as the Battle of East Cavalry Field to a certain extent was a meeting engagement, not strictly, but to a certain extent. Um, the June 30th cavalry battle at Hanover, which is about 15 miles east of Gettysburg, and that's where Jeb Stewart battles uh, Judson Kilpatrick, uh, two of the commanders under Kilpatrick were Custer and then also Elon Farnsworth, who ended up being killed on July 3rd at Gettysburg. That was a meeting engagement. And basically that meeting engagement means two opposing forces meeting in an area or on a battlefield when they either previously weren't aware of each other or didn't intend to, to have a conflict, to battle. Um, so many times because cavalry is that arm, that force which is operating out in the no man's land, between the armies or around them. Um, and really, that's again, that's the genesis of so many of the scraps that happened during the Gettysburg Campaign. Typically, they're meeting engagements. Um, other ones, now the, the large battle that actually opens the Gettysburg Campaign uh, is on June the 6th, and that's the Cavalry Battle at Brandy Station down in Virginia. Um, nearly 20,000 cavalry between the opposing forces battled there. Um, and the federal commander at the time, uh, General Joseph Hooker, commanded his cavalry commander to go find Stuart and engage him. Um, so that was more planned you know, than a meeting engagement, but Jeb Stuart and the Confederate Cavalry was very surprised because they didn't expect federal horsemen to come splashing you know, over the Rappahannock into their camp. Um, in fact, the, um, and this is in some of my writings that, uh, that I've done about Brandy Station, a, a lot of the Confederate Cavalry initially fought early that morning in their underwear. Literally, because <laughs> they, were, they were in their camp and they were, uh, they were surprised, you know, didn't expect it to come, so. Well, in a, a cavalry battle, do they use the horses just to get to the site and then get off the horses and fight, or do they shoot at each other from yeah, horseback? Yeah, both, both. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why it's always been so interesting to me. You know, as a, of course, as a, um, as a young boy, I just love the cowboys and Indians and horses, you know, and, and all that. I think they're the, the most noblest animals, you know, of all, and that, that captured my interest. But they, they are used in many ways um, in cavalry fighting and movements. In fact, um, there are different types of cavalry, which really comes out of the European um, style, and that's what America based it on. But just real simply, um, when cavalry actually is on the horse and the cavalryman stays on the horse during the battle and fights on it, um, typically that's called heavy cavalry. Um, they may be used as like a shock force, in fact, against other cavalry or against infantry. Um, and this is very typical of the Napoleonic era, you know, preceding the Civil War. Light cavalry, um, kind of the opposite of, of heavy cavalry, is when cavalry basically uses the horses uh, for movement, for mobility. So they may get on the horse and use, use it to quickly get you know, to one place, uh, fight dismounted as infantry, basically getting off the horse and, and fighting off foot, and then using the horses 
to get out of Dodge, you know, as fast as possible. So that, would that have been like a light brigade, like the charge of the light brigade? A, a similar, it yes. Called yeah, light because similar. of that? Exactly, right. And that's why we have uh, light cavalry, cavalry, heavy cavalry in the, uh, the European style. Um, and w when you actually use the, the, the European terms before the Civil War, um, which is dragoon, basically dragon with an extra O, um, and, and that comes out of that, uh, you know, that knight in shining armor on the horseback or whatever, sort of like a big dragon. Uh, heavy dragoons and light dragoons, same thing. So we, like I said, America modeled it on the European tradition. How would they train the horses to stay cool under fire? That's the tough part. <laughs> That's, and, and that really, really made it difficult for the Federals early in the Civil War because um, one of the things that, that put Southern cavalry <coughs> ahead of Northern cavalry um, especially at the beginning of the war, in the first two years of the war, was that a lot of the Southerners were used to, you know, since it was a, a bit more of an agrarian type of economy, um, used to riding horses, being on horseback. In fact, many Southern units had before the Civil War what they would call local militia units uh, on horseback cavalry. And these, these young men would drill together. You know, they would actually have mounted saber charges and they would practice drills and so forth and many of them that might have gone to to West Point or VMI or, or whatever for early training wanted to get into the cavalry because that's what they knew that's what they had trained um, the complete opposite is the federal soldier who you have a less agrarian economy in the north um, not so used to being on horseback um, had a very difficult time training you know as, as cavalrymen um, there's a lot of stories that come out of those early federal cavalry camps of um, these, these young, you know, federal um, soldiers being supposedly trained as horsemen, falling off the horses, you know, not being able to get them to move. When you take that and couple it with the fact that uh, when you're in battle, you have loud artillery, you know, shooting, you're trying to shoot on horseback, or you're trying to control your weapon, um, made for a very difficult time for a lot of federals. Even as a reenactor, I experienced some of that, so. How critical to the outcome of the battle was the East Cavalry battlefield? Really to the outcome of the battle itself, um, not so important. Um, a lot of these cavalry battles were what I call sideshows to the big show. Uh, at East Cavalry Field, although there was a lot of cavalry there involved, um, between the two forces, maybe as many as 12 to 14,000, um, really didn't have a, a, an overall impact on, on the Battle of Gettysburg itself. Uh, it, it was fighting on the right flank of the Federal Army, the left flank of the Confederate Army, um, and Jeb Stuart and his cavalry was held at bay. They could have very well created some mischief, you know, in the, in the rear of the Federal Army. Um, there's always the story had Pickett's charge actually broken through or if it would have split the line, you know, on July 3rd on the, the final day of the battle, uh, split the Federal line, and, and perhaps Jeb Stuart then, had he either brushed off David Gregg's Federal cavalry, uh, or, or pushed him aside or defeated him and got into the rear of the Federal Army, he could have created some mischief. Um, he did not. Jeb Stewart was repulsed. And, and um, you know, there was a lot of casualties out there and very classic mounted and dismounted cavalry fighting, but really no impact on the battle as a whole. But we do in the book um, discuss something that we, we did think was very important when it comes to East Cavalry Field. There is the very pervasive and romantic myth or, or legend about Jeb Stewart's movement going there um, in what, the area of what we know as East Cavalry Field today on the final day is some type of concert of, of action with Pickett's Charge. Um, you read about this in a lot of books, and it actually goes back almost to the battle itself um, when it was the popular thing to do to describe Jeb Stewart's movement as being like one prong of a two-pronged attack. Um, if Pickett's Charge breaks through and that's the one prong, it's almost like a pincer movement. That Jeb Stewart moves around the, the flank and then you know, hits the rear of the Federal Army at the same time. But there's actually, and again, we point this out in the book because we feel it's very important to put this in context uh, so you do understand, you know, the impact that it could have or, or did not have maybe on, on the battle itself. There's absolutely no contemporary evidence that Jeb Stewart had any orders to act at all, you know, in concert with, with Pickett's charge. Um, in fact, just the opposite, you know, as, as events play out. One of the things that he first does when he gets there in position on the, the John Rummel farm uh, is fire off a cannon three times in three different directions. If you're going to sneak behind your enemy, you know, that's, you don't do that. You don't create that noise and confusion. So, but it was a, a myth and fable basically that, that, you know, grew out of early descriptions of what was happening and perhaps some motivation to elevate, you know, what Jeb Stewart was doing there. Um, but we, we try to set it straight in the book. 
Now, we haven't really talked about your book yet, and I want to talk about it, but one more quick question about horses as long as we're on the subject. Do you know how many horses were at Gettysburg? Uh, yes, actually, the, the total was about, um, I believe, about 175,000, and that, that shocks a lot of people. That's horses and mules together. Um, almost one horse or mule for every man. How do they ever feed them? Or um, provide enough water for them? Yeah, the logistics is unbelievable. Um, they, they would carry a lot of these supplies in wagons, but you're, you're basically living off the land. You know, when that many, you have about that total number of soldiers, 175,000, and 175,000 animals descending on this small town, uh, which is maybe, well, I'm not sure, maybe a couple of miles from end to end, probably at that time less, uh, and about 2,200 people altogether. Um, imagine that, taking care of all of them, the sounds, the smells, you know, everything that goes along with it, um, and then having to take care of thousands and thousands of wounded afterward. I, I, think, I, I think that's why, and we try to make the point in, in the book, too, on various different tours, um, that it really needs to be appreciated what descended on this little town, you know, this this now, this gem, this jewel of Pennsylvania, you know, which is one of the most popular tourist stops in all the world, uh, let alone the United States. But um, it's a beautiful national park and, you know, clean streets and all that. But for us to go back in time nearly 150 years ago, it's almost unimaginable um, to, to try to appreciate all that that would have done, <laughs> you know, to that small town. When you go there now, if you just go on your own to, to look around, what do you look for? Um... For me, as a, as a historian, um, I, I always like looking for, for something new, something I didn't notice before. And, and I think that's, that's why it's always been important for me to, to go to the little corners of the battlefield. Um, a lot of those come out in the tours, <laughs> you know, in the book. They, they were so important to me. Um, but I'm always looking for something new, maybe to pick the brain of somebody that I might be there with, you know, whether a friend, if they've got some interest in, in some event or person or something about the town or the battlefield uh, to try to learn something new. And thankfully, Gettysburg is a, is a deep well, bottomless well, <laughs> you know, basically so much to learn and find out. Um, and that's, that's really what I try to do. If, um, if you're going to be there six or eight times during the summer, you know, that I normally am, whether I'm giving a talk about a book uh, or, or doing book signings or talking to a group, during my downtime, my free time, uh, I'll maybe go seek out some place I've never been, you know, go look at something, go through one of the cemeteries and take another good look at the stones, you know, the headstones or, or something in the town. Do you have some favorite obscure spots? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, which I really shared for the first time, you know, in the book, in these tours. And, and, I, and I do have to say, too, um, that since the book came out, I've, I've really been surprised uh, at the number of nerds <laughs> that have been <laughs> discovered. And I use, I use that term proudly because I am a proud nerd. When it, uh, when it comes to these obscure spots, I've always been very interested in the rock carvings that are around the battlefield. Uh, Gettysburg is very unique, you know, in that, in that respect. Um, those have been favorites of mine. Um, there, there's one, one that we highlight in the book where a young, I think it was about 20 years old, officer, um, in a Pennsylvania unit, the 140th Pennsylvania Infantry, in fact, was mortally wounded on the second day of battle uh, near the wheat field. And when his comrades finally were able to drag him back to, to uh, friendly territory, they couldn't bury him right away, but eventually they were able to bury him uh, on the grounds of this one farm in front of this little boulder. And one of his comrades thought enough to take a hatchet or a knife or something and just carve his initials, you know, in that little boulder um, so that he could be identified later. And he put 140 PV for Pennsylvania volunteers to identify the unit. And his father then, I, I believe a few weeks later, um, came out from Washington, PA, and was able to reclaim the body. It's this little out-of-the-way out corner, you know, in a field where most people don't go. Um, you have to crawl over a fence and usually go through crops, you know, and, and, on, and beat off the bugs and the ticks and everything. But once you get back there, it's a very ponderative spot. And, and in fact, to me, it's as ponderative and quiet and reflectful, you know, as anything in like the National Cemetery, for instance. Um, he's no longer there. You know, the body was taken away, but the spot is still important and still remains um, as a testament to, to really what, you know, the reality of war is all about. Um, that's those who give the ultimate sacrifice. And your book, you have directions about how to find that particular yes. stone mm -hmm. scratching? Yes, exactly. And we, we try to make the directions as clear as possible. For most of these, you have to walk there. They're, they're off the, the beaten path, off the park road, so to speak. Um, and to make a lot of these easier, too, for the rock carvings and, like, the field hospital sites and the outlying battlefields, 
Um, Steve Stanley, my co-author, and I also included the GPS coordinates to, to try to make it easier. So, because some of these can be really tough. And we've had people write to us and tell us that even as good as some of the directions were, you know, they were, they were very difficult still to find. Um, especially in the summertime, they, they can be. But we, we hope the GPS coordinates will kind of kind of help folks out. So. You also, it's a little off the subject, but you have in there uh, dinosaur footprints. Yes. <laughs> at Gettysburg. Yeah. Yes. That, that surprises a lot of people. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure whether the original stone cutters are those folks who put together the capstones, the stones that make up the, uh, the top of the, uh, the little bridge that goes over Plum Run on Confederate Avenue. Um, I, I'm not sure if they were aware they were in the stones. I think they were because they're, they are so easy to see and they're right on the top. And probably when they're cutting those stones down there, they probably saw them um, because there were actually, I forget what, uh, you know, what, what period. I, I did some reading on that uh, years ago about the dinosaurs that were actually in the Gettysburg area in Pennsylvania and, and so forth. Um, but I'm sure they saw them. You know, they're in the, and it's kind of neat that they're, they're still there. People can go and see them. We include them in the tour. They're not really a rock carving, per se, but uh, kids love to see them. You know, and, and in fact, um, a lot of youth groups, like uh, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, have been telling us they're actually using the rock carving store as by, basically like a treasure hunt. You know, and that's, that's really what it is, in, in effect. Um, they're, they're loving it. They're just enjoying it. So. Now, speaking of your book, if somebody buys this book, what do they get? Um, it, in my opinion, something a little different you know, than, than most guides. Um, when I first envisioned this book, in fact, I envisioned a black and white guide, basically. My, my first two books, you know, that, that's really what I knew. Uh, something like this, which is entirely in full color, um, not just the maps, but the entire book, was something that I didn't anticipate that could be done with it. Um, so I envisioned just something, you know, a lot more simple but, but than it is now, but broader than any guide really in any respect. Um, because there are so many tours included here, so many things to see that aren't included really in any other guide, any other battlefield guide, um, and even far beyond most historical guides. Um, so they're going to get a, a much, much broader view of not only the battlefield, but those outlying sites to see the town itself. Um, they're going to go over a lot of the back roads of Adams County, you know, if they go and follow those, uh, the field hospital sites and the rock carvings and a tour of the, the National Cemetery as well as the town's very historic Evergreen Cemetery. Um, I, but I think uh, even beyond that, what they get is almost, hopefully, a, a conversational style of touring as if they actually were, not, not with me, but maybe a battlefield guide or a ranger, um, because so much of what is in the book actually comes from those, those amazing folks, all in a package that we, we think makes it very easy to use because it is in color. Um, it's broken up in, in such a way that, you know, it's, I think it's easier to take out and, and with those maps that Steve Stanley um, has done, he's the, the cartographer for the Civil War Preservation Trust and, and does a lot of maps for a lot of other groups and foundations and so forth. And, and really is the more talented of the two of us, believe me, because I, I did the writing and the text, but he basically you know, took it off the ground and into the heavens as, as far as I'm concerned because his maps, and there are nearly 70 of them in there, um, just make it stand so different than any other guide because they're so much easier to use. They're, they're so much more detailed. For instance, he, on the maps, one of the things that was really important that he did was he has the modern park roads, the national park roads actually on the maps, which you really never see you know, on any, any historical maps of Gettysburg. And sometimes when you go out there, it's actually difficult to place yourself on the ground and see exactly where you are unless there's some other landmark, you know, like an existing house or, or a road which still exists today. But he actually put the park roads in there, most of which didn't come until several decades you know, after the battle uh, and the park was established and, and laid out. You can actually see how those units and those actions rolled right over the park roads, you know, right where you are. Um, th maybe there's a curve or a turn or an intersection in the roads, and you can see that this particular brigade fought right here, you know, exactly where you are you know, on those maps. And, of course, the, the background of them uh, is actual topography. So... Um, I, we think that makes it quite different, but we, we really think that's the total package, you know, that, that you get. You have a lot of things that are kind of off the beaten path of Gettysburg that, that you referred to, uh, like the, the different cavalry fields and, uh, and some of the battles that took place in the days before and after. When you were hunting around for them, did you find uh, areas that you thought were historically significant that had a shopping center built over top of them? This is some of that? Um, yeah, there, there are, although most of, well, if you go south of Gettysburg, you know, you find that quite a bit. Um, there, there's a lot of commercial development there. And I think 
a lot of people are concerned about the, the establishment and, and movement of the, the visitor center, the new visitor center and museum that's there, that might open up a lot more development to that Baltimore Pike you know, corridor. That, that concerns a lot of folks. Um, but on, on the outlying fields, actually the area is pretty lucky and the visitor is pretty lucky because those areas are pretty pristine. Um, Hunterstown, which is definitely worth mentioning. Uh, it's about four miles northeast of, of town, and that's where the cavalry fight happened between Judson Kilpatrick's federal forces uh, and Wade Hampton's Confederates. He was a brigade commander under Jeff Stewart. And this is on the, the second day, July 2nd. Um, the area is actually pretty pristine. The town is very small. Um, the roads are almost exactly as they were uh, during the battle. And the folks there locally are really fighting to save that battlefield, which is, which is under terrible threat of development. Um, just as recently as a year ago, a uh, developer had negotiated to build about 2,500 homes right on the battlefield itself. It almost came. The only thing, and if there's any silver lining and you know, something as, as um, uh, horrible as the downturn in the economy, is that the developer actually uh, you know, went out of business and, and couldn't fund and sustain his project. So that went by the wayside. So for now, the, the battlefield in Hunterstown is saved. You know, we don't know how, for how long. Um, there's easements out at Fairfield, which is about eight miles southwest of Gettysburg. Uh, another cavalry battle that happened on July 3rd. Um, thankfully, the easements have saved most of that. So the visitor is actually lucky and can go to these places. Um, there's, there's hardly any interpretation or signage, though. And that's why we really thought it was important to have detailed tours of them in the book. Um, because if you don't have something, you know, telling you what happened where, you can go to these places and, and you really won't know anything, you know, there's the, or you won't be able to uh, understand really what happened because there's no battlefield markings, nothing. Most of it's private land. If someone was watching this and they've never been to Gettysburg, what should they do when they get there? Hmm. Well, I, I would say, besides buying the book. <laughs> and having Assuming they you. bought the book. <laughs> yeah. the, the first place really to start is the new Gettysburg Visitor Center Museum. It's, it's a world-class facility. Um, it is definitely the place to make your first stop, to, to go through the museum, make sure that you pick up a brochure which has um, the park tour that's on it, because this will also help you. It'll be somewhat of a supplement to the book, although it's not nearly you know, as detailed, and it, and it just deals with the main battlefield and really just the, the more heavily traveled park roads. Uh, we take you on probably two or three times as much uh, distance, you know, or mileage um, than the National Park Tour does, but that that definitely has to be the first stop, as well as seeing the Psychorama, which has been just wonderfully restored. You know, you've, you've got to you got to spend time in that facility. Um, beyond using the book um, itself, is is also to hire a ranger or a guide if you have a specific interest, you know, in something there. We kind of hope that the book becomes a stepping stone for a lot of people that if they have an interest in a certain area of the battle. Or, for instance, say what happens out of Fairfield on July the 3rd really captures their attention. Um, after taking the tour that's in the book, if, if they want something further and, and you know, someone that they can ask questions of and take them out there and even point out more details is to find a guide or ranger who specializes there. Um, so we hope it's a, se a stepping stone in that respect. But the, everything, I think, has to begin at the Visitor Center Museum because that's really the apex you know, of, of uh, the, the Gettysburg experience. And is there something that people should absolutely not miss? First of all, there's the obvious things that they should not miss. I mm -hmm. guess the the, the uh, cops of trees and little right. round top. Are there other favorites of yours that people should not miss? Things that should be more famous than they are? Yeah, I, you know, and it's it's probably the most famous territory really in in all of the Civil War. Yet very few people have uh, have really walked it, and that's the ground to pick his charge. Um, Everybody knows about it. Everybody stands on one side or the other, either on the federal position or at the Confederate position, and looks over the field. Um, there are people who will spend hours there, you know, like, like I do, or go down to the stone wall at the federal position, the angle, the copse of trees, watch the sun go down. You know, I've, I've done that so many times in my life, uh, and, and so many people enjoy doing that. But I think it's really important to actually walk the ground, because when you're looking at one side or the other over the field, it basically looks flat, you know, almost like a pool table. And there are many accounts from Confederate soldiers who made that walk on July the 3rd, 1863, who described um, many terrain features in the ground. For instance, uh, there would be a swale where an entire regiment and sometimes even the better part of a, a brigade would get into. And they found some protection in there because the terrain actually blocked the Confederate position from them, blocked the artillery. You know, if they got a, a moment's respite for a while. 
And you really can't see that, you know, if you're standing on one side or the other and just looking over this ground, which looks so flat. But if you're actually walking it and you take different angles, okay, whether you're walking from the south side, you know, up the middle or go north um, out on the flanks of the area that encompass Pickett's Charge, you will start going through some of these swales that you don't notice from one side or the other, in which not only the federal position in the ground disappears as you're facing it, but the entire copse of tree. It's, it's so deep, some of these swales, and these are the actual holes where a lot of the Confederate soldiers got into, um, and, and I, th I don't think it's too hard to imagine why they don't, didn't want to get out of it. <laughs> when, um, once they did, of course, then they re-exposed themselves to federal artillery fire, you know, not just from the front, but also on the flank, um, in, the, in the case of Kemper's Brigade down on the southern end of the field. Uh, they were just raked, you know, down there by artillery fire, and that's where some of the deepest terrain features actually are. So when you walk through there and you start walking toward the federal line and look to your right and see those positions where the federal artillery was actually firing right into their, their right flank, so they were getting it from two different angles, um, you can see why they got in some of those swales and wanted to stay there, just how, hugging the ground. How long does it take to walk from one end of the field to the other, from the Confederate position to the, the um, stone it's, wall? It's a little less than a mile. Um, so probably, I, I think it's something that we can just be walked at a good pace in maybe 20 minutes, you know, or, or, or perhaps a little bit less, but um, it, it really needs to be walked to appreciate it. And I, and I guess that's one of those things that, um, because it's so famous ground, you know, and it's right there in the middle of the battlefield and everybody looks at it, it's sort of one of those things staring you in the face that not everybody really understands, you know, what it means or what the ground meant or what some of these accounts mean that these soldiers wrote about the terrain unless you actually walk it. So. If you go to Little Round Top, you allowed to go up and down the hills? Yes, there? sure, sure. And, and in the book, we encourage people to do that. On, on the federal park land, uh, you're basically allowed to go wherever you want to go, and, and people are encouraged to. Um, a lot of people will do that. They will charge up Little Round Top, which uh, I, I can test the fact that as you get a little bit older, it's not as easy <laughs> as it was when, when you're younger, But because uh, I've actually done that recently and, and, and made the climb up over Big Round Top, which is a you know, pretty, pretty healthy hike. Um, other than some of the, the extant homes that are on the battlefield that were actually there during the battle, uh, which may be leased out, and sometimes park rangers actually live there, um, there's, there's a bit of a privacy area around some of those structures you know, that they ask everybody to respect. But, but by and large, uh, anybody can go anywhere on the battlefield, and they're encouraged to. So some of, some of the walks that I enjoy taking is out on the first day's field, um, the farm that was owned by Edmer, Edward McPherson along the Chambersburg Pike. Uh, where the battle basically began, where the, con the federal infantry, you know, first came in uh, to meet the Confederate infantry that was pushing the federal cavalry back. Uh, not too many people walk the McPherson farm. It's, uh, it's basically surrounded by a fence, and it's not really cultivated, you know, and all that, but it's very revealing to, for instance, walk in the footsteps of the Pennsylvania Bucktails, you know, on, on late on that morning, on July 1st, um, to go where they went, walking into line. Uh, around the McPherson barn, you know, and on that land uh, along the Chambersburg Pike. And, and again, there, there are also two um, accounts where they talk about laying in ditches, you know, for a moment or swales or so forth and, and trying to get a moment's respite from the Confederate uh, artillery and musketry, you know, that, that was shooting at them. You get an appreciation for that when, when you walk the ground. Another, another of my favorite spots. You s did, did I read it right in your book that you say the Confederates clearly won the first day? Um, yeah, it, you know, it's a bit subjective. It kind of depends how you look at it. I think you'll get different answers from different historians. Um, it, it's an interesting subject. Um, if you look at it solely as who was the victor on the battlefield, who pushed back who, you know, who, where did the battle start and who controlled that ground afterwards, um, then it was a clear Confederate victory. Um, I think that needs to be qualified, though, by the fact that the federal infantry that was pushed back um, was pushed back to better ground that they ultimately held for the next two days and then ultimately defeated the Confederate Army um, at Gettysburg. And in fact, some of the early commanders, federal commanders on, on the battlefield, saw that better ground, which is basically comprised of Cemetery Hill, uh, Cemetery Ridge, the Round Tops, and Culp's Hill. Um, for instance, John Buford, the, Confeder the, the federal cavalry commander um, who commanded the first federal troops there at Gettysburg, and opened the battle, saw that ground and told the arriving federal general in command of the early infantry, um, John Reynolds, he pointed back to Cemetery Hill and Ridge that would be the ultimate federal position and told Reynolds that's where the army belongs, you know, pointing right to it. So he, in his mind's eye, saw that ground as the ultimate place 
where the federal infantry needed to go if it was going to make a stand. Um, so in some respects, and of course General Howard, you know, later on also recognized it as the place, and that's where he rallied the troops. Um, so some early commanders recognized that ground, and that's where they ultimately ended up um, fighting west of town almost as a, a, a fight in depth somewhat, um, kind of like a fighting withdrawal, that they would meet the Confederates west of town and then fall back to those better positions through the town. Um, but as far as who controls that, you know, that first field, at the end of the day, it's definitely the Confederates, definitely a victory. But then you have to look at, uh, you know, you can win certain battles and not the war. And if you look at Gettysburg as like a, a little war, yeah, certain battles were won, but who ultimately, ultimately won there. How did Robert, close did Robert E. Lee come to winning that battle? Mm, good question. <laughs> and, and definitely one for the ages. Um, on the first day, he, he was pretty close to, to possibly defeating those first two federal corps that were there. Um, he actually had some very good breakthroughs you know, on, on the second day, although they weren't coordinated. And I think that's one of the things that really plagued him at Gettysburg and also in at some other areas uh, was the lack of coordination. Um, those breakthroughs weren't really exploited, you know, and couldn't be exploited on the second day. Um, there was a, an attack on the Federal Center, um, Georgia Brigade under uh, uh, General Ambrose Wright, actually cracked the Federal line for a time, right there near the copse of trees, you know, where Pickett's Charge was going to try it the next day. So Pickett's Charge was a grander movement, um, similar to, to what happened on the second day. Um, but Robert E. Lee's attempts on the flanks weren't really coordinated. Uh, there's a fellow named good old Dan Sickles who kind of threw a monkey wrench in on the second day and changed things down on the southern end of the field. Uh, for good or ill, you know, that's, that's anybody's opinion. Um, and we don't get too deeply into that in the book, but well, a lot of those facts. What did he do, just a little sidebar, what did he do? For so Sickles, uh, he, he had uh, an assigned line back on the federal line along Cemetery Ridge um, and in the area of the Round Tops that he didn't really like. There may have been some shades of, of Chancellorsville uh, back in May of 63 that he was thinking about when he had an assigned position uh, that wasn't really very good and he really got pounded. Um, I think he may have been thinking the same thing was about to happen to him here at Gettysburg when the very low ground, you know, which comprised most of his position or so he thought, was inferior to the much higher ground that he could see out ahead of him, out towards the Emmitsburg Road <clears throat> and, and about a mile away. So on his own volition, um, and, and after getting several federal commanders to come and look at his position and try to get their opinions on whether he could move forward, none of which would take any, any responsibility for it, but on his own volition, he decided to move forward about a mile and takes his entire corps of about 10,000 men uh, out near what is now the famous Peach Orchard along the Emmitsburg Road um, and basically creates a salient, uh, a, a position that really couldn't be supported by the rest of the line because a lot of the federal line was behind him and Sickles' left flank was in the air. He was the very bottom southern left flank of, of the federal line uh, and really couldn't be supported. So when Longstreet's massive assault starts to roll towards him from south to north um, that day, Sickles is really rolled up and he takes very heavy casualties, astounding casualties. In fact, his core, the third core, uh, basically ceases to exist you know, after Gettysburg. Um, so he, he does that and, and again, like I said, really throws a monkey wrench in what happens on July the 2nd um, and may have, you know, unwittingly, but of course at the, the expense of a lot of loss of life, uh, messed up Lee's plans, you know, for what he wanted to accomplish down there on, on the southern end of the line. Um, and of course on, on July the 3rd, um, Pickett's charge is, is not very well supported, it's not very well coordinated. Although I think he did believe, Robert E. Lee did believe that it had a very good chance of success, uh, success or he would not have sent it off. Um, frontal assaults like that were becoming very passe, you know, by the time of the Civil War, simply because of the improvements in artillery um, and musketry and so forth. And a frontal assault against a very well entrenched enemy on, on high ground was not very advisable. But I think he felt that his men could do that, you know, that they, they could crack the line there and they could be successful. It didn't happen. So. What do you think of the job Longstreet did at Gettysburg? I, I think he's a very tragic figure. You know, I, I really do. He, um, he's a very controversial figure. He gets a lot of the blame, you know, for, for what happens there. And, and a lot of that is politics that, that rises out after the Civil War. He, he, uh, he does, um, you know, one thing that um, no, no Southern person, especially a very famous, you know, commander, uh, should do, and that's become a Republican. <laughs> that, that didn't help. 
Um, and, and he also, and the second thing as well, he also, to a certain extent, criticized you know, Robert E. Lee after the war in, in his writings. Um, but, but I think he's a, a very tragic figure in that he, he gets a lot of the blame for what happens at Gettysburg for, for things that don't really have any basis in fact. You know, on, on July the 2nd, he's accused of not getting his troops moving fast enough, that there was some type of an order that Longstreet received uh, early in the dawn that he was supposed to have been moving by that morning. It's, really, it's, it's actually not true. There was no dawn order to Longstreet. Um, in fact, by the time everything was coordinated, it was late afternoon, <clears throat> and he seems to get a lot of blame for that because, oh, if Longstreet had, had been able to send off his assault early in the morning or even before Sickles had moved, you know, what, what could have been the result? Um, he writes in his memoirs afterwards that he advised Robert E. Lee against, you know, sending Pickett's charge off. Um, so he, he gets a lot of the blame. He does get a lot of credit, though, you know, in, in certain circles that maybe he, maybe he was right, you know, about Pickett's charge. Uh, whether he wanted to actually leave the battlefield, take the Confederate Army, and maybe get between the, the Federal Army and Washington and Baltimore, you know, which uh, uh, General Meade, the Federal commander at Gettysburg, was ordered to do. Uh, if that would have made any difference, um, but he's he's an interesting, tragic figure, and he really gets it from both sides. You know, so was Meade very significant in the outcome of the battle, or, or was he too new? In, he was, yes, battle? and he, in my opinion, he's one who really doesn't get nearly enough credit. Um, Meade was was an engineer and a very uh, taciturn, very stoic, you know, commander. He's not. Uh, he w it wouldn't be one of those ones that you would look for to light up a cigar and tell a joke, you know, af after dinner. But on the battlefield. He had that engineer mind, he had that logical mind, and he was extremely effective on the second and third days of the battle moving troops back and forth. When Sickles was really hammered on the second day, when, when the southern end of the line, the left flank of the, the Federal Army was really beginning to crack, um, he moved troops there in support with some great help from Winsfield, Winfield Scott Hancock, the commander of the Second Corps as well. Um, but it was Meade who was also sending troops down to that end of the line. Uh, he, he was shoring up the line uh, and moving troops around in the northern part, um, up around Culp's Hill. Um, on the third day, whether you believe it or not, you know, whether he was able to predict, uh, as is written sometimes, that a massive inter infantry assault was going to hit on the center, whether you believe it or not, he predicted that. He did make dispositions um, to, to make any type of effort, you know, at repulsing that, effective. So really, as far as moving troops back and forth and what he did really as an engineer, you know, setting that line, making sure troops were where they needed to be, plugging certain holes. If you have extra troops or reserves in one end of the, the, the battlefield, sending them to another, extremely effective. And I think a lot of us, a lot of forget, a lot of us do forget, you know, he was very effective in doing that. Um, he, um, Oh, things like the movie Gettysburg, you know, or in certain books, when you watch that, I think General Meade has a total of about 15 seconds, you know, on screen time. Uh, but yet, really, he, he is moving all over the battlefield. He's, there's descriptions of him going constantly back and forth, you know, appearing here, appearing there, um, commanding, you know, certain units to move here and do that. Um, so he, he really gets missed in the annals of history when it comes to Gettysburg. Speaking of the movie Gettysburg, somebody who does get a lot of face time is Joshua Chamberlain. Yes. Is yes. that disproportionate to his importance in the battle, or is it fair? Um, yeah, probably disproportionate, but I, I, I give a, a lot of credit to, to uh, Michael Shara, you know, in his novel, because really it was his interpretation of what these people, whether they're commanders or citizens or soldiers or whatever, may have said and thought based on Shara's best interpretation, you know, of what he knew about these, these different people. Um, and I think it's wonderful, you know, for that. Whether there's, uh, uh, you know, was Chamberlain really that pivotal, you know, to, to the Battle of Gettysburg? Not really, probably not. You know, I think he, um, everybody has an interest in uh, Chamberlain and the 20th Maine and whatever the movie and the, the novel has done, you know, to bring all of these things to light can be nothing but good because it gets everybody, you know, an interest in all that. Um, but he was really, um, you know, a commander of a, a very small regiment there that, brave, unbelievable, you know, and the courage and what they did. Um, but uh, if the line there had broken, you know, by a couple of southern regiments, what really would have been caned, you know, in that area by the Confederacy? Probably not a whole lot. They probably would have not gotten much of a foothold, you know, on, on Little Round Top, wouldn't have been able to hold it for very long. Uh, but the, the amazing story of what Chamberlain and the 20th Maine did as far as their bravery, you know, and their... Um, 
their zeal, <laughs> you know, there on that little spur of Little Round Top is, is just amazing stuff. Um, what's in the movie may be a little out of whack, you know, as far as the importance of all of it together, um, but it gets people interested in it, and that's really what I honor the movie for. Um, some people are left by the wayside, you know, who may have been very pivotal in the battle, but the, the people and the actions and the events which really do come to the forefront gets everybody interested in everything, I think. So it's, it's been invaluable. When you started getting interested in Gettysburg, what did you read? Um, early on for me, I, um, I, I enjoyed the, the classics, uh, you know, about Gettysburg. I enjoyed the, the novel, although I didn't really discover it until probably the, the late 80s. Uh, Killer Angels uh, by Michael Shar that Gettysburg was based on. Um, but uh, Stars in Their Courses by Shelby Foote, wonderful. Uh, the, the works of Catton. Um, anything really that I could get my hands on in the, you know, the, the public library, the school library about Gettysburg. Uh, magazine articles, you know, I, I loved and, and just enjoyed reading those. But for me, it, it began to turn when I really got serious about it after college. Uh, began to turn into a desire to read those initial or those primary accounts for myself. So that's where I started to, to in my travels, go into some of these like university libraries or at Carlisle to War College um, and, and finding these diary accounts and letters and so forth for myself. And that's really where the love of finding those, those primary writings, those things from the, you know, that the soldiers left behind, um, that's formed the basis basically for what I use to work from now. Um, but I, I would voraciously read footnotes, like for instance in, in Edwin Coddington's book on Gettysburg, which is still the Bible, you know, study for the campaign. Uh, the footnotes are as good as the book, and in going through there and reading where some of these different things are, you know, all oh, this letter, it's, it's in Carlisle, you know, I'm going to look for it my next, the next time I'm there. Um, and then you pull out the letter, and, and maybe there's just a sentence or two from it that's used in a book, but oh, you've got four or five pages, you know, of just wonderful stuff about Gettysburg where he's talking about his experience. Uh, that you really enjoy reading, and this is this is something that really a lot more people, you know, I, I know would enjoy seeing if they could, they could read these primary accounts in full, you know, for themselves. If you know a certain letter is at Carlisle, how do you go about looking at it, finding it? Well, the folks there are very helpful. When when you get to Carlisle um, and you go to it, and, and it's actually been moved off campus now. They have um, the History and Education Center that they call it now, the War College. Uh, where you go in there and the, the folks are just fantastic. Usually you can go online and get a listing of exactly what you're looking for and there may be like a book or a letter or a collection or something um, that's given a code. And if you print that out or, or give that code to one of the staffers there, they go right back and find it for you. I mean, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, that's they, what these folks do. They bring out the original? Uh, yes, yeah, in many cases, sure, yeah. Um, you allowed to touch it? Sure, but you have to be very careful. A lot of times with some of these old gloves and or, um, old books and, and letters and so forth, you have to wear gloves, you know, which, which is good. Um, they don't allow you to handle some of the very fragile items, you know, to, to protect them. Um, they might be laid in front of you so you can, you can read something, or if you're looking for a copy or an image, there may be one that they already have back there, you know. Um, and I think that's good, too, because actually years ago, and this is going back 15 years or more, um, at the, the old... Uh, facility that was on the campus, a lot of those old books you actually could go back in the stacks and get for yourself. Can't do that today. You know, some of these books maybe from the 1860s or 70s and stick them right in the copy machine, you know, and start copying them. And I noticed a lot of these books, they were just, the pages were falling out and they were getting torn up and all that. And, and I think it's, thank goodness you can't do that today because it's, it's helping to preserve these primary documents. You have a lot of little boxes in your book that, uh, that say did you know, and little right. factoids. How often, when you were going through those primary documents and diaries, uh, did you come across something new? That you just, well, hey, you never knew that before. Yeah, quite, quite a bit, and that's, that's why we did it. In fact, that is actually the original idea of Ted Savas, the man, dire managing director of our publisher, Savas Beatty. Um, those did you knows, which I did pull from mostly primary documents, you know, and some secondary works, because they were always interesting things um, about Gettysburg that I sort of had in the back of my mind, you know, and wanted to make sure that I could work them into the text. Um, they were originally in the text um, as I, I had laid it out, and when Ted was going through an early draft of it um, and doing the initial editing, just sent me an email one day that, why don't we do this? Why don't we create, you know, these little boxes or these little areas, we'll call it Did You Know, where you pull these things out, um, interesting little facts, you know, trivia and so forth about something that may have happened uh, while you're looking at a particular action or area of the battlefield. And I thought, what a terrific idea. You know, so we, we, Steve and I started doing that. We started pulling them out. In fact, Steve came up with a couple of them. 
Um, and it kind of serves to not only give you something interesting to, to think about you know, or consider when you're on a uh, certain part of the battlefield, but it kind of gives you a breather too. You know, and something, something to sort of give you uh, a little break while you're going through what may be, you know, several pages of a description there. Um, some will give you a chuckle. <laughs> some will almost make you want to cry, you know, when you, when you read some of the, uh, the very, uh, you know, desperate accounts sometimes in there of like woundings, you know, and so forth. Or, uh, but they, they give you a little break and in, in something interesting to, to kind of, you know, break up that narrative a little bit. So. We talked a little earlier about the, the, the places where the battle took place that should be more famous than they are. What about some of the people? Are there some people you think people really ought to know more about? Sure, yeah, and I, I think a lot of that comes out of the tour, for instance, of Evergreen Cemetery, because um, Evergreen Cemetery almost reads like a telephone directive, 1863, <laughs> Gettysburg, with all the famous people and the famous landmarks that are there, uh, you know, named after these families, that's where you'll find them. Um, but there, yeah, there are some local folks, for instance, the uh, Elizabeth Thorne, you know, the, who is the de facto caretaker of the Evergreen Cemetery. Uh, she's six months pregnant by the time of the battle. Her husband, who is actually the caretaker of the cemetery, is off down south serving in a Pennsylvania infantry unit. It's left to Elizabeth, who again, like I said, is six months pregnant, uh, to bury several hundred soldiers on, on the battlefield. And initially buries, I think, something like 105 of them in Evergreen Cemetery before the National Cemetery is established. People come to help her out, even her aged father. Um, the, the work is so hard, you know, and with the disease and, and all of that, um, and, and the weather, the, the brutal heat, most of them just help her out for a half a day, you know, or a day or whatever, and then go their way. She's, she's left to bury the majority of them. It's an incredible story. Um, one of, of forbearance and stamina, you know, in, in dedication, um, by, by somebody, a local citizen there that, that is almost unequaled. You know, that, that's quite a story. Um, what also the citizens do that's very important to the formation of the battlefield, uh, as well as the National Cemetery, you know, really needs to be told. But that was one of the, the nifty things about having something like, you know, this tour of Evergreen Cemetery, because that's where you can showcase all these personalities. And that was sort of an ulterior motive, you know, behind it, besides looking at the cemetery itself. Is that where Eddie Plank is buried? He is. For people who don't know, uh, who is Eddie Plank? He had nothing is, to do with Battle of Yeah, he's a Gettysburg Eddie. He's a, um, a baseball Hall of Famer, Southpaw, uh, before my time, but <laughs> did a lot of reading about him. But he was uh, uh, named by, um, uh, I think it was Sports Illustrated, as one of the 100 greatest baseball players of all time. <clears throat> and he is a local who was actually uh, born and raised in Hunterstown, a few miles away. And, uh, or his mother was, I'm sorry, uh, in, in Hunterstown, and he lived on a farm with his family outside of Gettysburg, uh, but made good in, in baseball. Um, and he's buried in Evergreen Cemetery. One of the nifty things about his gravesite is there are these two concrete urns, which are on both, side, both sides of the headstone for he and his wife. Just about any time that you go there, you'll find six or eight baseballs in each one of those urns. And it's, it's really nifty, and I point that out in the book. According to your book, uh, Babe Ruth considered him one of the toughest pitchers he ever faced. He did, yes. Yep. That's quite, a, quite an endorsement. How important was John Burns, who was referred to as the hero of Gettysburg? Um, according to him, very important. <laughs> but he's, he's one of my favorite old curmudgeons you know, of the battle. Um, oh, boy, what was he? He was in upper 60s, I think, 68 or so at the time of the battle, uh, who ventures out on the first day and in fact hooks himself up with the Pennsylvania Bucktails uh, that morning because he wants to meet the rebels you know, on, on his ground and, and defend the area. Um, he's got a very storied history, some of which we you know, recount in the book, but um, th this crotchety old fella goes out there and, and actually gets on the firing line you know, on the first day. Um, is wounded probably three times, you know, maybe, maybe a few more. I think he claimed a few more wounds. Um, but he, uh, he's left on the field there and either crawls or is helped to the home of a neighbor later that day. Um, and then is able basically to spend the rest of his life recounting, you know, his participation in the battle. President Lincoln wants to see him when he comes in November to give the address and, and actually asks for, asks for him and, and has an audience with, uh, with John Burns. But he's a great story. Um, you know, when you get deeper into his story, uh, maybe some of his claims, you know, weren't really true and all that. But... Uh, just like I uh, recounted in the book, you know, what's on his stone is, is really true, patriot, just a simple word. Uh, he's, he's a good lesson for all of us in many respects. 
So uh, we only have a couple minutes left. If somebody mm -hmm. buys this book and they show up at Gettysburg, how should they use it? How should they proceed? Well, it's got wheels on it. I tell everybody, take it out for a drive. <laughs> that's, that's really what it's for. Um, I think the best way is, if you're not really familiar with the battlefield um, and you haven't toured it too much, is to start with the tour of the main battlefield itself. Um, now, this is something that could take all day or, or actually several days, but in going through it, I think you'll be able to pick out certain areas <clears throat> that you know, may be of interest to you. Um, some people may want to skip ahead you know, and, and go to a certain action or, or Pickett's Charge or something like that, or maybe go to Culp's Hill, you know, which doesn't get a whole lot of visitation, but is one of the most beautiful you know, areas of, of the field. Um, and then the other things that hold your interest, um, whether it's the rock carvings <clears throat> or tours of the cemeteries, or maybe the other battlefields. You know, you'll uh, go to many parts of Adams County doing the tour of the, the, the field hospital sites and really get an appreciation for how many people and homes and areas, you know, the battle really touched. Uh, during the retreat of both armies, and a lot of these hospitals are on those corridors of retreat, thousands of soldiers were left, you know, on the doorsteps of farms that just couldn't be taken along anymore, or maybe that's where... Um, certain elements of each army had their camps. Um, pe people have really said that that tour opened their eyes, you know, to how wide-ranging uh, the effects of the battle were on, on the people of the area. What should you uh, not miss when you're in town, in um, the actual town of Gettysburg? Yeah, um, definitely when, when you're in the square, you know, which is really the central point, literally, uh, of the town, um, you definitely want to be there because it, it was the central point for the town during that time. You know, the town square usually was. This was the, the gathering place, the marketplace, you know, the socializing place for a town. Um, it's also the area where on June the 26th when elements of the Confederate Army that are moving through and going towards the Susquehanna uh, end up there. Uh, shooting, you know, scaring the jeepers out of the, the local citizens and tearing down the Union flag, which was on a big flagpole right in the center of the square. Um, it's to be appreciated for that as well as the witness buildings, you know, that are, that are around the square, probably chief of which and most popular of which is the David Wills House right on the square. And that is the place where President Abraham Lincoln stayed uh, on the night of November 18th before giving the Gettysburg Address the next day. Uh, there are a lot of buildings, and we point these out in the tour as well, that, that actually have artillery shells in them. Uh, some, some may have actually been shot there. Some were probably put there as curiosity items. Uh, it was kind of like a badge of honor, you know, for some homeowners to be able to show an artillery shell or some kind of damage to their building. Um, uh, as well as, you know, the historical buildings that even rose up after the battle. Um, the, the old uh, Methodist Church, which was the GAR building, the uh, Grand Army of the Republic organization for, for Union veterans uh, following the Civil War. They have some beautiful paintings in there, um, a great collection. You know, there's, there's just so much to be seen in the town itself, which really is also the battlefield. So, You referred earlier to two other books you've written. What are they? Mm -hmm. uh, the first one, yes, I, I co-authored that with Eric Wittenberg, good friend of mine. Uh, it's called Plenty of Blame to Go Around, Jeb Stewart's Controversial Ride to Gettysburg. And it talks about uh, the eight-day ride through Virginia, Maryland, and Pennsylvania of the Confederate cavalry that, that Jeb Stewart took along with him prior to Gettysburg. Uh, the second one, which was also co-authored with Eric as well as our friend Mike Nugent, is called One Continuous Fight. And it is about the um, Confederate and Federal retreat from the Battle of Gettysburg. So it basically bookends the battle. So we talk about the advance to it um, as well as the retreat. And it really spurred you know, my, my interest because those two books do have tours of the areas that we talk about. It spurred my interest in, uh, in doing a tour book like this. We've been talking to David Petruzzi, and this is his third book and latest book, The Complete Gettysburg Guide. David Petruzzi, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. I enjoyed it. You've been listening to a podcast of PA Books, a production of PCN, the Pennsylvania Cable Network. We'd like to hear from you. Our email address is pabooks at pcntv.com. Like us on Facebook to learn more about PA Books.